introduce the um, welcome to the amazing new world of esports. Um, where our presenters here are uh, Hector Rodriguez, owner of Optic and uh, director of uh, influencer management at um, REVXP, and uh, also Danny Ciccone, man managing director as well. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just wanted to have a seat. All right. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to the coveted interrupting lunch time slot. <laughs> uh, promise, uh, I know we've got about a half an hour, but we'll more than likely uh, get you guys at, out of here a little sooner and, and let you enjoy, enjoy your lunch. So uh, my name is Dan Ciccone. I'm the managing director at RevXP. I'm joined with my partner, Hector Rodriguez, uh, who is in charge of influencer management as well as creative direction for RevXP and also happens to be the owner of probably the most uh, recognized and winningest team in eSports, which is Optic Gaming. Um, before we get into the presentation, I guess just a show of hands, how many people are familiar with eSports? All right, cool, five of you. Um, it's actually, it's good, that's why we're here. Uh, how many people actually play video games? Okay. Competitively. And, uh, okay, good. <laughs> um, so this is gonna be much more of an educational seminar uh, about eSports. Um, Hector and I were talking about this beforehand, and with this conference in particular, you know, everyone's showing off their cool technology, their technology wares. Um, we're not going to be actually showing you guys technology just because it's so inherent in esports and what we do, and especially what Hector and the team of Optic does from a day-to-day -day basis. So um, that's, again, that's really the whole, whole point while we're here today. I would encourage you to interrupt us as much as you want during the presentation, if any questions come up. Um, I'm primarily going to take you through just what eSports is and help you better understand what the opportunities are, but I would very much encourage you to direct any questions to Hector when it comes to um, the social engagement, the technology. Um, you know, Hector's really been on the ground with his team individually and collectively for the last seven or eight years. Um, so if there's anyone in the room who really understands connectivity, technology, how millennials are embracing all of these and how it's just really ingrained in their lifestyle, I think Hector would probably be uh, the best person to direct those questions to. So we like I said, like please. Pardon me? We don't like to be called millennials. I'm kidding. Okay. <laughs> um, but like I said, please feel free to interrupt us with, with any questions as, as we go through the presentation. So you want to grab a seat and then we'll... Uh, sure. Okay, so what is eSports? Um, I already asked for a raise of questions. For those of you who don't know, eSports is really just a short term for electronic sports, competitive video gaming. A lot of the video games that have come out, uh, especially over the last several years where they saw a lot of success, is when they provide multiplayer modes. So in the past, you know, you go back 10 or 15 years ago, if you're playing a video game, um, you, have a, you had a lot of fun, but it was very much an experience that you just enjoyed by yourself. Uh, as time went on, as technology advanced, then you might be able to play with a couple of other people uh, based on a, a little LAN system that you put together. Once technology really started to take off, connectivity really started, the, the technology really got a lot better. Um, a lot of the, the game franchises, a lot of the video games realized that they could actually extend the franchise, they could extend gameplay, they could extend this experience if you could bring in other players, right, primarily your friends, um, and you don't actually have to be in the same place. So that's really how competitive video gaming started is that you didn't necessarily have to be in the same room and you could compete by playing certain video games um, within, a, within a controlled environment. Um, and uh, again, through different communication systems within the actual consoles themselves, gave you the opportunity to not only communicate with your friends if you were in different places, but actually create new friends in different places as well. So um, that is eSports in, in a nutshell. I don't know if, there, if there's anything you, you want to interrupt me with. but um, So again, for a lot of people in the room, when we talk about eSports, this is kind of the reaction we get. It's just a big question mark, not really sure what eSports is. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of people in this room just in the nature of the business that you're in, you've at least heard of some of these brands, but may not necessarily know how they impact the world of esports. This is esports. Um, for a lot of you, there's probably a lot of different logos up here that you've never heard of. 
We have no idea what they do. Um, but that's why we're here. Um, our company, RevXP, is a consultancy to help agencies, clients, non-endemics better understand the esports arena. And one of the best ways for us to do that is we actually look at esports through the lens of sport versus the lens of gaming. Um, for me personally, what I found is I, I've been in the gaming space for, for 10 years, but when you talk about gaming, it means so many different things to so many different people. Um, but when you talk about sport, especially the folks in this room, right, there are rules of engagement. There's a lot of tradition in how you um, approach sports sponsorship. And it's actually very similar within, within gaming, but because a lot of this is very unfamiliar to the folks in this room, um, that's where we find the translation actually works best, is to take gaming and eSport, I mean, it's called eSports for, for a reason, but then how do we take all this and put it in a format that's much easier to understand? And again, it's easier to understand when you start looking at eSports and video gaming through the lens of, of sport. So, um, you know, when we talk about the leagues, there's publishers, um, there's competitions and franchises that are taking place, uh, the different teams, the personalities that are created, the platforms where the content is distributed. Um, but just like traditional sports, the communities and the fans that evolve out of all these things is really the biggest opportunity that we find in, in esports. So um, just to give you guys some examples up here. So for the leagues, it would be something like um, ESL, uh, Major League Gaming has a number of different leagues. The publishers would be the game makers themselves, the folks who actually publish and, and create the games. Franchises would be something, I know some of the guys were talking earlier about Call of Duty, Halo, League of Legends, right? Those are some of the, the those are what we would consider franchises w within the industry. Um, there's competitions that, that are taking place. Incidentally, um, I, we don't go through a lot of numbers as we go through this presentation. If you look out in the public sphere, you're gonna see numbers ranging anywhere between 180 million to 230 million people actively participating within esports. Um, but the, the way to reach them is much different than what we've seen in traditional media, so to speak. Um, and then again, it's, it's those types of communities that, that, are, that are huge. Uh, the way the fans engage, it's, it's an incredibly immersive experience. So, but like I said, these are just, um, these are just a, a number of different platforms and a number of folks who really are, are very prominent within the space. Um, we're gonna see more people coming into the space because it, it's, it's truly global. Um, and as we go through the presentation, we'll start to tie some of these things together. So more than anything right now though, eSports is, it's about engagement, it's about opportunity, and it is now. The example that we like to use is if you look at the UFC maybe 10 years ago, if you look at NASCAR 30, 35 years ago, that's where eSports is right now. And we like to use those two examples because NASCAR and UFC had incredibly passionate fan bases and it was that fan base that really started to elevate um, both of those sports to where they are now. When you go into the esports space, the folks that are participating, um, it's already mainstream. The big opportunity, and why we say now for esports, is because esports is finally gaining a lot of notoriety within the, what we call traditional media outlets, right? So in the past, if you wanted to find out about esports, typically had to go to gaming sites. If you look through the trades now and you just literally just Google eSports, you're gonna find Fortune Magazine covering it, Forbes covering it, um, USA Today. There's a lot more information that is available through, non or through more traditional media outlets. So it's finally starting to get the attention of the community that's sitting in here. But if you go to the actual folks who are engaged in it and participating, it's, it's already mainstream. Again, uh, we're not gonna go through a lot of numbers here, but um, it's what we like to refer to as a local global community of millions of men and women that are actively participating um, in competitive video gaming. And the reason why we call it a hyper local global community is because the fans that are created and the friendships that are created through participating in esports, it's truly on a global scale. I mean, when you sit down with your console and you put your headset on, you can literally talk to anyone 
in, in the entire world um, and, and start creating relationships through that. Um, and it's 24-7, 365. You know, it's, it's constant co connectivity. One of the things we try to encourage our clients is to get out of this mindset of, of online and being online. It's really about being connected. Uh, and the reason why we say that is, you know, I think if you go back five years ago, talking about online, it made sense. More than likely, you would have to physically go to a computer to become connected. Uh, once the smartphone came out, right, all the, all the different apps that are available, now being connected, it's more about being connected than being online. So. Um, Hector, the team, the players, they're constantly connected. They don't think about, oh, I have to go to my computer to get online to do something, whether they're on their console, connected to the TV, connected to their iPhone, connected to their tablet, connected to a computer, connected to a game console. They're literally connected to the entire community 24-7. So there's a huge opportunity there for, for marketers um, that once you start to understand that lifestyle of that, you know, we refer to it as a digital lifestyle, but they would more than likely look at it as, as a connected lifestyle. So once you start figuring out where the opportunities are within that realm, it makes things a, a little more clear. So it, one of the really fascinating things about esports is that while these young men and women are competing in these games, they're also creating these big personas and they're creating um, a lot of lifestyle content around these games. And there's a huge opportunity there as well, especially when, when they're connected 24-7. Um, that really kind of leads into the next point where we say it's social on steroids. We'll have a slide for you towards the end of the, pr of the presentation, but Optic Gaming, for example, there's an active roster of, of eight different people on the team, and they get about 15 million followers across various social channels, right? So they are constantly in communication all day long, talking to their fans, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram. And if you follow a lot of the posts, it's an actual conversation that's taking place. Um, I think when you start looking at different social platforms and the way people participate, more times than not, it's people just kind of shouting and, and throwing their opinion out. But if you look at, it, it's more of a conversation that unfolds with these men when they're participating and sharing their lifestyle with, with, with their fans. The other thing too that, that's really interesting, um, I think it was this past year, there was an NFL player who tweeted something from the sideline and the NFL just came down on him, right? I mean, it's like a no-no, you're here to participate, you're here to play a game, you shouldn't be tweeting. I think it happened in Major League Baseball too, there was a little tuft in, in, the, uh, um, in one of the dugouts. Within esports, even during a tournament, when they're, there's a break in the action. Um, this is what really helps keeps the fans engaged because these guys will actually have conversations and talk about what's going on and respond to the fans and the fans will respond to them. Like, just because they're act actually in the middle of their craft doesn't mean that it's going to interrupt the social conversation that's in unfolding and, and taking place. So that offers obviously a lot of unique opportunities with, within the space as well. Um, one of the most important things is that the audience is actually driving the experience. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that because esports and, and being involved with it, whether you're actually playing a game or you're watching it, um, it's available to you pretty much however you want to consume it. So a lot of the technologies that are in place within esports that are inherent within esports, a lot of other traditional sports are actually trying to duplicate it. Um, if you look at you know, we, ju we use the example like um, the new stadium that Jerry Jones built for the Dallas Cowboys. If anyone's familiar with that arena, I mean it's, well, stadium, right? There's huge LED jumbotrons, um, there's Wi-Fi. Uh, I know Major League Baseball right now is trying to look at ways where they can actually insert more technology into the actual ballpark to make it easier for fans to interact that are actually at the ballpark. So a lot of the technologies that traditional sports and stadiums are trying to implement, it already exists within the esports arena. So whether they're vocalizing themselves through various social channels or actually talking to each other through, through the he headsets, um, they're literally and virtually interacting with each other throughout the entire experience. And there are a lot of traditional sports that, that are trying to duplicate that. 
uh, one of the things that's, that's really important and one of the reasons why we're here is because the audience really embraces non-endemic sponsors to come in. Uh, more than anything right now, the community, the players, the teams, the fans, non-endemic brands coming into this space at this time just provides validation. And that's really what they're looking for. They're looking for traditional brands, non-endemic brands to come in and validate the fact that, you know, this is their passion. They love doing this. I mean, there's a reason why there's two, 250 million people participating in esports on a global basis. Um, they're getting some love from the endemics, right? It seems very, makes a ton of sense that technology partners would be there. But there are actually a lot of opportunities for the non-endemics to get involved. And at this stage of the game, um, they're definitely going to be looking for that kind of validation. And that validation will definitely get, get rewarded. Uh, and currently, um, it's, it's a low cost of entry. Uh, we're just seeing, we've seen a nice steady rise in audience participation and, and sales and, and people coming in, into esports. Um, but because of the kind of because of the kind of notoriety that esports has been getting, the kind of attention that it's been getting over the last few months, um, the cost of entry is, is definitely going to start start to increase. So this is a, a quote I really like. This was uh, at, before we formed RevXP. This is a, a quote that we pulled from the president from Revolution Marketing in Chicago. And he basically said, look, the secret to breaking through with sponsorship alongside a non-endemic product is very simple, right? Make your brand endemic to the experience of being a fan. Become a new endemic. Bring something new to the space. And that really resonated with us because within esports, it's literally at that stage where you can create opportunities for yourselves. If you go to traditional sports like football or baseball and They've got governing bodies within the NFL and Major League Baseball, and then you have to deal with all the TV networks, right? There's three, four, five different folks that are putting all these rules in place as to what you can and cannot do. Uh, we don't have those barriers in esports. I mean, yeah, there's going to be some, some rules, but it's pretty much a, a, a white canvas right now to get involved. So when you're looking at the audience and when your focus is on the audience and what they're craving, and they will definitely be very vocal about what they like and what they don't like, um, it's a fantastic opportunity to actually get in on the ground floor and create opportunities that, that no one else has yet. Um, so, and then finally, you know, the, the one aspect of this that we're really concentrating on is the influencers. It's folks like Hector and his team. Like I said, there's a roster of eight players where, um, well, you know what, we'll just, we'll just show you the, the, the numbers, right? So when you look here, um, these are indiv individual players um, these are their gamer tags. Um, and we just kind of broke it out by each platform. But you'll see, you know, so, some of the players are more comfortable with expressing themselves through one social platform versus another. Um, but this is, this is where that constant connectivity comes in. And if you look at some traditional sports stars, even if you look at entertainers in general, their numbers don't even come anywhere close to this. Um, I don't have, have anybody in the room. Have you guys ever seen that movie, The Truman Show? Yeah. Huh? Okay, so these guys, I would say, are actually like the real life Truman Show. They are constantly in the public eye, and what I mean by that is that they're just in constant communication with their fans. They live a very raw life, so if they have a bad day, their fans know it. If they're having a good day, their fans know it. Um, the way they express themselves emotionally, there's just—it's not necessarily constant connectivity through technology, but it's constant connectivity with the fan base as well. So um, again, these are, are, are really impressive numbers. Um, a couple of the other things that, that we were talking about is, you know, the, the people that are actually participating in the sport, but the people who are watching it, they have that digital lifestyle, right? They're constantly connected. They don't have to think about technology. It's just ingrained in their lifestyle and what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. I personally become somewhat amused when, when I go to, when I watch the news or I read things in, in different trade publications um, and we start talking about viral. I think everyone has, the same way everyone has a different definition of what engagement is, I think a lot of people have a different idea of what viral is. Um, you know, if you watch the news, if something gets 250,000 views, it went viral. Other outlets, it's got to reach a million views before it goes viral. Um, the reason why we say it's so 2010, outside of playing video games, these individual players and teams create a ton of content, whether it's them actually playing a video game, 
um, or it's just sharing their lifestyle. And they put up videos, what, almost on a daily basis, right, individually or collectively. But getting 250, three, four, 500,000 views, a million views, it's, it just happens, right? So these are, like, the way traditional media outlets are, are, are looking at what is going viral, when you're doing this on a daily basis, that doesn't even exist within, within this audience's vernacular. And it's, again, it's just because it's such a massive audience and it's just a form of communication for them. So, um, again, amongst ourselves, we, ne we never talk about viral. We just figure everything we do is viral. So it's, it's gonna be huge. Just so you guys know, we can actually pr provide a link later on, but uh, Optic Gaming moved into a really, really cool new house. So they've got the roster of players all in the same house. It's a lot easier for them to create content. It's a lot easier for them to practice their craft. Um, it just increases, increases the bonds. But when they moved into the house, I think Hector put together like a 10 minute video, just walking the fans through the house, showing them what was going, you know, how cool it was. And within, I don't know what it's up to now, but within, day, within two days, it got up to like six, 650,000 views. So again, it's just those types of things where it's very second nature to the audience as well as the entertainment end of this that comes very naturally. Uh, we spoke at a conference a few months ago in, in, in Brooklyn, um, hashtag sports fest, and there was a company there that was talking about, they created a company to help traditional sports stars actually create content that would speak to Gen Y, millennials, young men and women, um, how, we, how we would like to refer to them. Uh, and we thought it was really interesting that, you know, that is, again, it's already inherent within esports. Um, because even though they build up a following by winning championships and by, by playing a bunch of different games, the reality is the way they maintain those relationships and the way they maintain that audience is by engaging the fans on a day-to-day -day basis. And they can actually engage with them one-on-one. -on -one. So an example that we use is, Hector was talking about earlier, um, the new Black Ops 3 Call of Duty game came out and they've already figured out who they're going to be um, playing, playing the game with. But that's really the, the, the whole point of it is that not only is it about them playing amongst themselves, but they invite the fans to come play with them as well. So if there's a new map that comes out, if there's a new weapon that comes out, there's a new strategy they wanna try out, um, they will literally tweet out to the fans like, hey, I'm gonna be online at this time, right? The first 10 people will just start rotating and they're actually playing with the fans. When was the last time you ever heard Tom Brady say, hey, you know what, I'm gonna be down at, at the park throwing the football around, who wants to make me down, I wanna try, right? try some new moves or I wanna try some new routes, never happens. Um, you never hear of an NBA player say, hey, I'm gonna be at the local Y if you wanna play a game of pickup. Um, but that's really where there's a unique opportunity with that kind of one-on-one -on -one interaction and why they get the type of loyalty and the huge followings that they do because they're actually interact interacting with fans on an individual basis. It's not just a, a collective you know, tweet and goes out, I mean, then there's a discussion that unfolds. And that obviously presents huge opportunities for, for marketers. So uh, what is RevXP? I mean, we basically created uh, the, this consultancy to help marketers navigate their way through this space. There seems to be quite a bit of confusion within esports, and we created the company to, uh, to help alleviate a lot of that confusion. My personal background is in, in sports um, sponsorships and I've been in the, the gaming space and, and professional esports for the last five or six years. Um, started off at MTV, then went with, their, with their gaming unit, went over to IGN and IPL, uh, worked at Major League Gaming for a while, was fortunate enough to meet, meet Hector and got to know a number of the players uh, and teams really well. And we just thought it was a really good combination because we've got the sports background. Hector has a phenomenal track record of creating personalities and getting in with the influencers and incorporating the influencers into the, the, the brand message. So, um, and again, you know, our, our big thing is we're looking at this through the lens of sport. And anyone who's interested in a space, that's really what you should be doing is looking at esports, looking at gaming through the lens of sport. There are a lot of parallels, but there are also a lot of new opportunities uh, available. So, and there's a lot more flexibility, again, just because at this early of a stage, um, there's a huge opportunity for marketers to, to participate in ways that you cannot in, in traditional sports. 
So, and then again, whether it's the leagues, the publishers, social platforms, um, we've got relationships with, with, all these different, with all these different aspects of, of the business that we can facilitate. So um, I'll close it with some recommendations, but I would really encourage everyone when we're done with the recommendations to ask as many questions as you can. Um, I think Hector serves really well to talk about that type of one-on-one -on -one interaction as well as, you know, when some of the brands come into the space, some of the, some of the things they do right and some of the things that, that they do wrong. So um, the, tradi the traditional metrics that most of you are probably used to working within are irrelevant. Again, when you look at those social numbers and when you look at constant connectivity, um, there's gotta be a new kind of social currency that's created. So if you're just looking at impressions, if you're just looking at some of the traditional ways that you've tried to measure sponsorship, it's not going to work within, within eSports. Um, and you know what, it's not about gaming. Again, it's about sport. If you start looking at it through that sports lens, it, it should make it a lot easier for everyone. Um, we also encourage you to focus on the audience, not the game. I mean, especially the fact that a lot of people in here don't play video games. If we start talking about League of Legends or Call of Duty or Halo or Smite or Counter-Strike, right, you're not gonna have any idea. Um, the same way, you know what, I, like I watched hockey and my brother's a huge hockey fan, and after 15 years of living in Detroit, I still don't understand half the damn rules. But, um, but what really resonates to me is that the hockey fan is a lot different than the baseball fan. Right? I mean, inherently, they might have the same needs from a marketing standpoint, but the way they interact with the sport is, 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 very, is very different. So um, again, focus on the audience. Um, you also need to get out of your, your comfort zone, and I know that's very difficult for a lot of brand marketers, even agencies, everyone's very protective of their product. Um, but the reality is that this audience is the audience that you're targeting. The people that are actually playing the games, the, the, the professional players, the audience, they're the ones who are consuming your product. And because they're looking for that validation, they're going to be more than happy to express how they feel about your product. Um, but you literally have to put it in, in their hands. You can't tell them how to use your product. You can help guide them, but it's really about listening to the audience and, and seeing how your product is incorporated into, into their lifestyle. So um, that really leads us into the last point where we are encouraging our clients to actually participate in the space, right? not be present. We were asked a question a, a few weeks ago and they said, hey, you know, what, what does it mean to have a logo on the team uniform? We said, well, you know, the logo, if you wanna look at it just from a static standpoint, it's logo, right? It creates awareness. But for the team and the partnerships that we engage in, it has much more to do with participation. So when you look at the different sponsors of Optic Gaming, there's an actual partnership. There's a relationship there. There's, um, we, we just sat down with the CPG company yesterday, uh, a couple of different brand managers as well as their agency, and the conversation literally just revolved around um, how do we create content, right? What does the team need? What do the fans need? What does esports need in general. The focus really was not so much about the product. The focus was on what does this space need, not only for validation, but to be even more successful than it is, and how does our brand fit into that, and how do we, how do we present that to the fans. So again, we would encourage everyone that getting involved in the space, just throwing up a logo isn't going to do it. Um, we're looking for partnerships and looking for different ways for, for our brands to actually participate and bring value into the mix. So um, that's it for my stand and pitch. Um, I would invite Hector to uh, join me in any Q&A, but, but again, I would love to have you guys direct some questions to Hector because um, again, he's just running the most famous and successful gaming franchise uh, literally in, in the world and can speak very well to how they work with brands, how they, um, things that work, things that don't work. Hi, I, I've actually, I'm, I'm a kind of a fan of esports, and I, I think it's interesting. Um, I think there is opportunity there, but as a marketer, I've, I've tried to sell esports, you know, conceptually to clients, and there's a lot of head scratching and pushback, and and I'm just curious, like in your, in your, from your point of view, what do you think is like the intellectual hurdle that that people have, like accepting esports? Um, in the same lines as some, you know, even like fringe sports. I, you know, we can talk about the Olympics and some of the weird sports there, and people will, you know, they'll see that as more of a sport 
like you know curling or whatever um, than than something like you know video games. I'm just wondering like what are, what are the challenges there because I I I struggle with like trying to sell that and I, I could use some advice. Sure. Well, I think that that's that's a question for you for the gray um, hair snow punch. So <laughs> yeah, um, look, it's a lot of what we're doing with this consultancy is education and you know getting back to that one of those first slides, right? I mean this is. This is confusing to a lot of people. Um, what is really important for your clients to understand is the majority of the people in this room, um, they're, they're not participating in, in video games. So uh, a lot of folks that I call on or I talk to, they say, hey, you know, I, I know that my son or my daughter's on the console, but they're not really paying attention. They don't really know what they're doing. I guess what I would go back to the marketer with is like, look, for, forget, let's just stop talking about video gaming in esports for a minute. Let's just, again, focus on the audience. When you look at, I think YouTube just put out a release, right? And this is something that anyone, whether you're, whether you're in the space or not, you're going to be able to appreciate this. I think half of the top creators on YouTube are creating gaming content. Um, the majority of streaming that takes place on YouTube is about video gaming. So it's very easy to show where the passion of the audience is. And when you start backing into the numbers of, of how many people are actually participating within this, right, then it's, just, it's more so about understanding their, their mindset. Um, because it's true, when you look at this, right, there's 20 different ways you can go within esports. You could sponsor a team, you could sponsor a league, you could just, um, actually, I would argue, are there folks in here that are running programmatic? Just a quick show of hands, like how, how many people represent a brand that's, that's running programmatic? Okay, more than likely, you are already in this space and you don't even know it. Because when you go onto like an Xbox Live app, um, the, the video game apps, right, they're running all that programmatic through, the, through that. Um, so a lot of folks are actually in this space, they just, they, they just don't know it yet. But it, it is very much an educational process for the clients to, to get them involved. But again, I would focus much more on the metrics of the audience versus worrying about the specific game. Once your client understands this is where the audience is and how the audience um, actually embraces lifestyle within the sport and the kind of communication that takes place and the communities that are built, it's much easier to have the client understand what the opportunity is. And again, that's why we're approaching it as sport because there are a lot of parallels relative to the communities and the fans and the way they express themselves through traditional sports that you're going to find in, in esports. Only I would argue that it's, it's actually even more hyper-engaged, right? Because all the technologies that we were talking about earlier, that technology is inherently, it's already created, it exists within esports where traditional sports are now trying to figure out how to take advantage of these technologies. Or you could always invite me in and, and we could have a half hour conversation and pour your client a couple of drinks until they agree. Anyone else? So. Hi. Um, how you doing, Hector? Doing well, thank you. I, I wanted to hear from you, um, fr from my perspective as a person who has never um, played video games or even watched other people play video games. Can you talk about the, a little bit about the emotions? Like what, what are you going through when you play and what are you going through when you watch? And how do you feel being watched? Is it different playing alone and playing being watched? Yeah, sort of. I think, I think the, the whole personality in esports thing just kind of fell in my lap. Uh, I used to be an account analyst at AIG and every night I would get home and play video games. I, I got good enough to where I felt I had something to offer. Uh, in the form of a tutorial or helping people become better. So I started making uh, videos on YouTube. Um, little did I know that it would turn into this massive, you know, social media empire in a sense uh, because of, like he said, the connectivity that, that we have with uh, the engagement that we have with uh, people. I don't like uh, personally when, when, uh, when, when you compare it uh, or you call it eSport, even from the beginning, I always knew that people were gonna get hung up on the word sport from the beginning. So I, for me, it was always calling it competitive gaming and then educating them into the actual reason as to why it's called electronic sports. Uh, it's a lot easier to say this is competitive gaming, just people playing against each other playing video games. As opposed to you say eSport, they're like, well, where's the physicality, right? Um, but 
to to answer your question, how it feels, I don't know. The emotions are just the same competitive, you know, drive that we all have, I guess, uh, within us to just be better than your brother, your cousin, your opponent. Uh, so for me, the feeling is just the same feeling that I get when I used to pay, uh, play, you know, basketball in, in high school. It's it's just something that you do. You know, it, it's a competitive drive in you, I guess. So I think the other part of it too, though, is that it's it's literally a sport that is. Um, Right. It's available to anyone, really. I mean, at the end of the day, you either have basketball skills or you don't. You have hockey skills or you don't. At the end of the day, you do have to have video game skills. But literally, like anyone can pick up a controller and participate. And there's such a variety of, of games and strategies and, and environments that you can participate in that um, the technology behind it and the experiences are so vast and so real that more than likely, whether there's a video, whether you're a quote unquote gamer or not, there's definitely going to be something within this space that you find of interest. Um, but it's also the aspirational part of it too, right? When you're, if you're really into one of these video games and you see someone who's just amazing and you're trying to figure out how they make their moves, I mean, I don't know, I remember when I was in high school, all like five foot 10 of me trying to do these Air Jordan moves, right? Every kid, it didn't matter if you were six foot tall or not, everyone was trying to duplicate these, these moves. You had that aspiration. Um, and we see a lot of that within, within competitive video gaming as, as well, that um, there's a lot of aspiration that people want to be able to achieve a certain level. And I would argue that most people feel like they actually do have the ability to achieve things within a, the video game realm that they may not be able to in, in other aspects. Hi, um, Dan. To your last point, can you and Hector give us some examples? Uh, over here, can you give us some examples of brands that have done a good job of participating um, and you know becoming endemic to the space versus just product placement? So yeah, you know, I'll, I'll let Hector talk to the endemic stuff I in a minute. But on the non-endemic side, um, there's two examples that I, I like to use. Um, one of them is Coca-Cola. Um, you know, they dove into League of Legends, they're sponsoring actual, they're, they're at the actual event, they're at the actual arena. Um, they're in it for the long haul, which is actually very important. You know, I, one of the things that I really don't like when we sit down with an agency, um, whether I worked at an agency or I was actually in sales, when people say, well, we want to test. And I'm like, you don't test esports, you don't test competitive gaming. It's, it's a very transparent transaction, and the audience is going to know if you're in there just slapping your logo up, expecting credit, or if you're actually bringing credibility. So what I like what Coca-Cola is doing is, um, number one, they're in it for the long haul, but secondarily, they're trying to create experiences, right? What we talked about earlier, where what kind of value can they bring? So I believe at one of the events, um, you know, they have these, I forget what they're called, the, the, the different sticks that everyone's holding up. Um, well, they basically gave the fans a way to individualize those, right, so they could individualize their expression. Um, they also just created a, a weekly esports show on IGN. So, look, some of the things are working and some of it's not, but I think what the fans and what the industry appreciates is that Coke is in it for the long haul and they're trying different things. Some things are resonating really well. Um, and when I'd say they're, the areas where they fall short, I don't think they're making huge mistakes. They're just being very transparent about how they're trying to participate in the space. Um, a bad example, hopefully no one from Mars is in here, um, I would say is Snickers. Snickers ran a campaign where they created videos with quote unquote professional gamers and basically did not, had them playing video games and did not feed them, right? So the point is these people were virtually on passing out. They were, the way they were, their gameplay obviously was going south. I mean, it's kind of obvious, keep me up for four or five days and my performance is, is going to deteriorate, right? So if you don't feed someone for five, six, seven hours while, while they are playing video games, of course it's gonna deteriorate. So they have these kind of like cutesy little videos. They went, and I mean, I think what I was looking at, if they got maybe 15, 20,000 views, it was a lot. And, and the reason why it didn't work is just because number one, it was forced. Um, number two, it was obvious. And number three, it wasn't bringing value. It wasn't really adding anything to the conversation within the competitive gaming space. So, um, and then I would also argue that, that the professional gamers that they identified really didn't have that big of a following anyway and didn't have that really good of an association 
within the space anyway. So again, you have one client who they're in it for the long haul, they're participating, right? They're not just being present, but they're participating, they're trying different things, they're being very transparent. You have another brand who had a, probably a very conservative brand manager and said, I'm only going to do this, right? This is my message and this is what I'm comfortable with and it, it was much more forced. You know, Coke is putting their brand and the experience in the hands of the fans where Snickers was basically trying to force their message onto the fans. So, but I was from the endemic side, I'll, I'll let, let you kind of talk about it more. Just uh, what was the question about the endemics? I think uh, for the for the majority of the space in in, uh, in gaming headsets controllers, I think that you know because it's their business and they're a part of it, I think that they've all done it well. I don't know, I can't really pinpoint anybody that's done it wrong. Uh, you know, people put product in front of the people that are going to get you know eyeballs on you know like-minded individuals, and it's pretty simple. So endemics so far have done a pretty good job. But the other thing, you know, the other thing too with success, whether it's endemic or non-endemic, is that they're actually engaging the, the, the players and the teams and having a conversation. So the endemics, you know, the Astro headsets, they'll actually have conversations with Hector and the team, right, to talk about different aspects, different elements of, of their product, um, what they like, what they don't like, what can be improved, what have you. Um, and it's the same thing that the conversation we had yesterday with one of our non-endemic brands for a partnership that we'll announce next year. But it was terrific. We sat down in the room with the brand manager as well as the agency, and we just talked about content creation. We talked about product placement, and we were, we had a very open discussion about, hey, this is where it's going to work, and this is where it is not. Um, that's personally one of the reasons why I really enjoy working with Hector is because he has a very diplomatic way of, you know, the whole purpose of, of a lot of people's existence in this room is to bring ideas to their clients. Right? We all think our ideas are the best ideas and they're cool. And there are a lot of really cool ideas that people bring to us. But when they don't work, you know, they, they don't work. And that's what's terrific about working with the influencers and going directly. Um, they're so much more accessible than you would see in, in other sports. You know, if you go to major NBA teams or, or NFL teams, um, right, there are a lot of barriers to actually get to the influencers to have those discussions. Um, those barriers are, are much lower. You can actually have a discussion with, with the actual influencers and, and walk through the different opportunities. So I, I see the, uh, I get the high engagement and it's a very passionate community, but in an, an indelicate question, it also seems demographically very narrow. It's an overwhelmingly young, white, male audience. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it's a culturally, you know, I know there's some there's some diversity and there's, and there, yeah, there's even some women gamers as well, but as a culture, it, it can be at best misogynistic or at worst openly hostile to women, both in terms of the portrayals, the imagery, as well as to actual players. Mm -hmm. So it seemed to me that's, a, you know, that's an indelicate place for, for a brand, certainly a mainstream brand or, an, or a risk averse brand. So what are your thoughts on that? I don't, I've, I've personally have never experienced that. Uh, we have two girls on our team. Uh, I think that uh, the focus that is put on you know, states like the ones that you just made are just, I don't know. I, I know that ignoring stuff like that is, is in, you know, uh, sweeping it on the rug is not a good thing to do, but uh, I, I try to run a positive-minded atmosphere in my uh, community, per se, so we don't really even engage in, in any negativity like that, so. so I mean, it's twofold, so, well, threefold. One is, um, I would love to see what numbers you're pulling from, right? Because the numbers that we have, it's actually an incredibly diverse um, audience that's watching it. It's not primarily young, rich, white men. Um, the people who participate, their income level does tend to be a bit higher, but it is, uh, is actually an incredibly diverse uh, cultural makeup. Um, I think that there's also, gaming has been kind of a scapegoat for at least the last 20 years. Um, the way I approach it is I'm a history buff when it comes to, to, to media. So I remember when, well, I wasn't alive then, but from what I read, the, you know, when the first radio serials came out in like the 30s and 40s, that it was like late night radio, um, right? It got a little dark and there were a lot of people complaining that, you know, radio went from this beautiful medium bringing this beautiful music and now they're telling these horror stories at night and what's it going to do to our kids, right? And then... I also read comic books when I was a kid, and if you look back in the 40s and 50s, there were movements to 
get rid of pulp and get rid of comic books because of the way it portrayed women and because of the violence that unfolded and it's going to, right, it's gonna deteriorate the structure of our children and they're all gonna run around and turn into zombies, killing everyone. Um, that didn't happen, right? When Elvis Presley came out and he was shaking his hips, they were afraid that now all these people were gonna get hot and bothered and suddenly they were gonna start raping women because Elvis Presley showed you that it was okay to shake your hips on TV. I guess my whole point is if you look back in history, there's always a reason, I, I, and I think it comes up that when something's relatively new or when something comes into the mainstream and it's not really well understood, um, that people tend to focus on what they don't know um, or try to draw parallels within other things. You know, when you look at the, the, the audience um, and some of what you're talking about, I would encourage anyone here to, when you get back to your desk or even here, a lot of you guys have your computers up, go to usatoday.com and start reading through some of the articles. In fact, you don't even have to read the article. Just read the headline and then go straight to the comment section. I mean, there is such vitriol and, I mean, the conversations that unfold on usatoday.com are just unbelievable. But if you go to a sporting event, right, and you see people tailgating, um, when you look at where people congregate, there's always going to be the trolls and a couple of people that are getting out of hand. Um, you know, when we look at what's going on with the NFL, right, like they're getting a lot of pressure because of um, domestic violence, right, and all those things. But the reality is that's such a small percentage. So I'm not saying that, you know, there aren't going to be people out there, but I think within the professional space, um, these guys hold themselves to a higher standard and you're not going to see that. But within the, you know, the communities that follow them, yeah, you're, you're, you're gonna see some of that. Um, I think what's really cool, especially with Ashley in particular on Optics team is um, she, they all hold their head up high, you know, and, and they don't go after, people who go after them, they either just ignore it or they just kind of put them back in line and, 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 and move on. So I think you're gonna see that no matter what medium it is. Um, but I also think that the professional players are actually doing a lot to help start, start to curb that. But it's such a small, such a small percentage of, of, of people that it's, it's really not on our radar. Like Hector said, they don't, it doesn't really come into their world that much. We don't engage in it. It's 2015. Yeah. Hello, um, I guess as a follow up question to that, I was wondering if you could comment on things like Gamergate and how brands can navigate that because, you know, whether what side you fall on, when you have them canceling a major South by South by West panel due to bomb threats, due to rape threats, just over comments on gaming, right. you know, that's not something that's Yeah, so, um, yeah. I don't know if you have anything to, to say. To me, the whole Gamergate thing is, look, again, you can't just, well, you can ignore the type of vitriol that's out there, right? Part of my personal problem with Gamergate is that it is being perpetuated by the media. If you talk to people within the space, I mean, half the people who are actively in the space didn't even know about it. Um, so that is something that just constantly gets perpetuated by the media. Um, then pulling out of South by Southwest and then coming back in, I mean, that's, that's really giving in. Again, it's just such a small number of, of trolls out there, um, but within our realm, it's, it, it doesn't affect us at all. I would, I would argue if you go to any online community, I mean look, you can go to Yelp, read some of the comments about, uh, on Yelp about how passionate people get about food. I'm like guys, you know, you're talking about like cronuts. There's no need to make death threats over cronuts. Um, but again, literally, right, you can go to any online forum and you're gonna see a handful of loonies out there who they're just looking for attention. And that's really, just Gamergate just got kind of blown out of proportion at the time and it had much more to do with, with what the media was doing with it versus what was actually going on within, within the gaming community. So I don't, did it even touch you guys at all? Like, I mean, I, I, I didn't hear about it until weeks after. I'm not saying that there isn't a problem there, obviously, uh, but it is the internet and in the internet when people say, if I keep on hearing Hector talk, I'm gonna blow my brains out. They're not necessarily gonna blow their brains out. So the bomb threats and all that, I'm pretty sure it was a 13 year old kid. I mean, I can't say that, but it's just the internet, trolls. Anything else? Or are we gonna end on a bomb threat? <laughs> Anyone? 
Sure. I, yeah, so look, I, I get it, but uh, you know, the, uh, again, it, if you're going to take esports, gaming, and put it in its own bucket, you can have that argument all day long. What I would tell people is, you know what, when we go to an NFL football game and look at the people tailgating, right, and look at how things get out of control and look at the problems that they had in the past. I think most marketers realize that that doesn't represent the typical NFL football fan, right? There's always going to be that minority in every single sport where you have people doing things that are inappropriate, saying things that are inappropriate. Um, there's still a lot of organizational bodies that are being developed and created. You know, the other thing you have to remember about esports is that it's truly global. So these aren't just like little sections, you know, it's not like they're just little uh, 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 North America contingent and then this European contingent. Um, even though you have players and competitions in all those different areas, it's all still globally connected. So there's still, um, we're still in the process of creating some of these governing bodies, right? It's literally you have to put an organization in place to s oversee a global phenomenon. Um, it's happening. There are certain teams out there that are requiring certain standards in order for them to participate. But secondarily, there's an argument to be made that, you know what, you don't, if, if you address it the way that you're talking about it, for a lot of people out there, it's going to give credence to what they're doing. If, if Hector and or any of the other teams or players, especially the high profile teams and players, went on a campaign to try to tone it down, if anything, that would more than likely enrage the knuckleheads who are already doing it, because ultimately, why do people do that? They're looking for attention, right? Our focus is on like, look, there's so many good things, there's so many opportunities um, and there's literally many paths for a traditional brand marketer to come in and create value and create opportunities here, that that's where our focus is. And it's, quite frankly, we've been fortunate that the folks that we've sat down with, things like Gamergate and things like, you know, these trolls coming in, I mean, it just hasn't, if you physically attend one of these events and see the way that people participate, it's phenomenal. There's a lot of camaraderie. So those are the things that we're focusing on. Again, with the traditional sports, the immersion of it, the camaraderie. Um, yeah, and with that, we're going to be outside for the next half hour, so uh, we've got to wrap it up. We took way too much time. So, Sorry about that. Thanks, guys. Thank you.